Almost everyone you ask has an opinion about China's one-child policy. Whether it was the right thing to do, whether it was cruel and needless, whether it saved China from having to feed 400 million mouths, whether it set up China for future failure as one of the world's fastest aging countries. The policy is well covered in the literature. The Wikipedia article is voluminous and well researched. I really suggest that you go read it. In another video, we looked at measures taken by a country to help raise the birth rate. We saw how challenging it was for tiny Singapore, barely 5 million large, to have more babies. Today, we're going to look at the opposite situation. But first, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Asianometry newsletter. Getting tired of me is saying the same thing? I'm saying the same thing over and over again. I want to plug another post from the newsletter. I went back and looked at the time when the Chinese government just stopped approving video games. No warning, no real thing that anyone can do about it. Zip not a nilch. It was a year without new mobile video games. Check out the post for that in the Asianometry newsletter coming up soon. You can find the link to the newsletter in the video description below, or you can just go to asianometry.com. Subscribe and I'll try to make it worth your while. You can expect a new newsletter every four days at 1 a.m. Taiwan time. Much thanks. The general narrative on the one-child policy is that the birth rate in China was high and out of control until the policy's announcement in 1979, three years after the death of Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong encouraged people to give birth and reproduce, and it pins the one-child policy on successor Deng Xiaoping and his circle of cadres. It is a pretty compelling narrative and definitely reflected the impression I had of China's birth rates prior to starting on the research for this video. With that being said, I would characterize this narrative as a simplification. The Chinese Communist Party had long been interested in birth and population policy. Basically from when it assumed power, the party sought to address issues in China's already massive population. People looking to confirm the general narrative on China's reproductive policy prior to 1979 being out of control often point to remarks made by Mao. Mao's most cited comments on the population come in 1949. Dean Acheson, U.S. Secretary of State under Truman, had said that China's quote-unquote overpopulation led to the revolution. Mao, miffed, said in response, It is a very good thing that China has a big population. Even if China's population multiplies many times, she is fully capable of finding a solution. The solution is production. The absurd argument of Western bourgeois economists like Malthus that increases in food cannot keep pace with increases in population was thoroughly refuted, in theory, by Marxists long ago. People looked at the statement out of its context and took to believe that it means that Mao was all for the babies. Looking at it within context, however, it feels more like of a communist response to a Western criticism than a weighted declaration of policy. Yes, Mao has made contradictory comments on population and its control, but he likes to make contradictory comments in general. I would say that this is in line with his character. Charismatic but cagey. He's Mao Zedong. He says whatever he wants. As the 1950s dragged on and China struggled economically, Mao looked at reducing China's fertility rate as a way to address persistent poverty in the country. In 1957, he addressed the 8th Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. Of course, birth control is still necessary, and I am not for encouraging more births. It would be too late to wait until our population size reaches 800 million. It's not okay to have human reproduction in a state of total anarchy. We need birth planning. Of course, a year later in 1958, he launched the Great Leap Forward and set any population control policies aside for another day. The Great Leap Forward caused a famine that killed millions of people, but after it ended, China's fertility in the urban and rural areas rebounded and more. The birth rate soared to a total fertility rate of 6 to 7.5. We had a baby boom. Mao apparently refocused on population control, making a few public comments on the matter. In 1960, Mao met with World War II General Montgomery and told him, quote, We are working to control our population growth. End quote. In 1965, he told the Minister of Health, quote, You need to include birth control when you launch rural health programs. End quote. 
More telling of Mao Zedong's thinking, though, was the implementation of new vastly stricter population policies that came into being while he was still very much in charge. In 1971, the Chinese government decided to shift gears and get very serious on the country's burgeoning population. 1971 saw a marked shift in the government's mood with regards to population control. They debuted a policy called Later, Longer, Fewer in Shanghai. Later as in having women getting married later in their lives. Longer as in couples wait longer between having children, at least four years. Fewer as in less children, two for urban families, three for rural ones. Where previously these policies were voluntary, now they have become much more mandatory. To enforce them, the State Birth Planning Commission extended its authority into each village and neighborhood. They kept records on women's birth and gave factories quotas on how many births those areas were allowed. Women who got pregnant without permission would see both themselves and their family members harassed for an abortion. Once they hit the quota, then they were pressured to get sterilized or have an IUD inserted. Throughout the 1970s, abortions and IUD insertions skyrocketed. From 1971 to 1973, IUDs doubled to 13 million. Induced abortions went up to 5.9 million, up 30%. Female sterilizations were also up over 70% from 1971 numbers. These rates would continue throughout the 70s right before the one-child policy. And when judged on its goals, the new policy was quite successful. Total fertility collapsed from 5.8 in 1970 to just 2.7 by 1978. For a poor agrarian society, such a low birth rate can be said to be unusual. My economic demography class taught that economic growth and the education of women tend to lead to societies with declining growth rates. Was this the case in the birth rate decline in the 70s? Likely not, as China's economy was stagnant through the 1970s. The Cultural Revolution likely had something to do with that. So it's likely more the new coercive policy. All this happened just before the one-child policy was ever announced. In the first decade and a half after the launch of the one-child policy, 1979 to 1995, the decline was from 2.8 to 1.8. On an absolute number of births, we would probably say that the 70s were more successful in suppressing births than the 1980s, when the one-child policy was actually in effect. So why launch it? Deng Xiaoping ascended to power after Mao's death in 1976. Deng has been consistent in his support of population control policies throughout his entire career. With his ascension, the Chinese government moved towards economic reform and a gradual opening up. The Party Central began thinking of ways to connect with the rest of the world and generate wealth so to pull its titanic population out of poverty. In 1979, Deng met with Japanese Prime Minister Ohira Masayoshi and told him that he intended to quadruple GDP per capita by the end of the century. China, by the end of the 70s, was marching towards the 1 billion person mark. Deng and the party saw the sheer size of that number likely as an impediment to achieving its economic goals. Those were indeed ambitious goals. Deng and the party intended for economic reforms to do the majority of the heavy lifting, but you can also see where the party thought the future one-child policy could help. Less children in the next generation means more wealth can be concentrated. It means less kids to have to make rich. The historical records at the time are not clear about who actually first came up with the numerical goal of one child per family. Chen Muhua, head of the National Family Commission at the time, most likely had the biggest hand in pushing for it within the party, but she probably did so with strong support from Deng and Hua Guofeng. However it came about, the government was encouraging the one child family limit in 1978 before making it into a full-on policy a year later in 1979. After the policy announcement, a circle of scientists led by aerospace engineer Song Jian promoted a bevy of neo-Malthusian theories to help encourage the policy's uptake. Song had attended the 7th World Congress of the International Federation of Automatic Control in Helsinki, Finland, and was convinced by their population control theories. He brought them back to China to help boost the one-child policy. Song Zhan's work had gained a lot of publicity amongst the party with his population projections. 
he presented data that China's ideal population was around 700 million, two-thirds of the contemporary 1 billion number. His work gained acceptance amongst high-level cadres, including the powerful Chen Yun, and helped convince the party at large that a one-child policy was the only way to avert Malthusian disaster. While it is sometimes mentioned and accepted without dispute that Song Zhan and his coven of scientists quote-unquote hijacked the population policy process, the party was already deeply involved in population policy at the time and was pondering the one-child limit even before Song came into the picture, like I said earlier. China's one-child policy was just one of a bevy of population control policies being executed around the world at the time. India, Bangladesh, and Indonesia had their own too. India's was particularly vicious. China's policy of coercive birth control went further than all of them. In 1983, for example, China performed 14.4 million abortions, 20.7 million sterilizations, and 17.8 million IUD insertions. That is a high number. But for all the nasty headlines, the thing is that the one-child policy's long-term effect was relatively small. Here is why. Much of the reproductive birth rate declines had already been absorbed a decade earlier. There was less fat to cut. Implementation was also spotty. For nearly 30 of the 36 years the policy existed from 1979, half of all parents in China were allowed a second child. And today, China's birth rates are in line with that of her Confucian North Asian neighbors, Taiwan, Hong Kong, South Korea, and Singapore, all of whom are in the same place today without needing a one-child policy of their own. It is like as if the policy hardly mattered in the grand scheme of the country's development, and we should reflect on that. All right, that's all I have for today. Subscribe and like the video if you liked it and um, take care of yourselves out there. See you later.